In this video, we're going to talk about angular momentum. Now, what is angular momentum? Before we get into that topic, let's talk about linear momentum. Perhaps you've learned about this already. Linear momentum is basically the product of an object's mass times its velocity. It's represented by the Greek symbol rho. So if you have an object of mass m and it's moving, which means it has velocity, then the object has momentum. Momentum is simply mass times velocity. It's mass in motion. So anything that moves has momentum. A train that's moving fast has a lot of momentum. It has a lot of mass and it, it has speed. So it's very hard to stop an object with a lot of momentum. Now the units for momentum, we see that the mass is in kilograms, V is in meters per second. So the momentum is going to be kilograms times meters per second. So anything that's moving forward has linear momentum. But what about angular momentum? Any object that rotates or revolves around another object has angular momentum. Now the equation for angular momentum, it's equal to the inertia of an object times its angular velocity. Now you might be wondering, hmm, why did they use the letter L? I mean, what does L have to do with angular momentum? I really don't know why they did that, but they did. So that's just one of those things you need to commit to memory. But you could see the similarities between this equation and this one. Inertia is like the rotational equivalent of mass. And angular velocity is like the rotational equivalent of linear or tangential velocity. And so those two equations, they share similarity. So let's say if you have an object that is rotating on its axis, you have the inertia of the object, which can vary based on the shape of the object, and then how fast it's spinning would tell you its angular velocity. Now, there's another formula for angular momentum that you need to be familiar with. We're going to derive it starting with this equation. Now, the inertia of an object is equal to the sum of all the inertia of all the, I guess you could say, the point masses. So it's mr squared. And omega, the angular velocity, is equal to the linear velocity divided by r. So if we replace the inertia with this expression, so we're going to have L is equal to mr squared. Let's ignore this symbol for now. And omega is v over r. We could cancel an r, which will leave one r left over. So we get this formula. L is equal to m times v times r. So this is another formula that you can use to calculate the angular momentum of an object. So let's say if this is the center of a circle and you have a rope with a ball of, let's say, mass m, and it's rotating, or rather, it's revolving around that point. And let's say it's moving in this direction. So that's the velocity of the object. r would be basically the radius of the circle. It's the distance between the center, the axis of rotation, and the mass of the object, or rather the object itself. So that would be r. So in that situation, that's when you'll use this equation. But now notice that we said that momentum, let's see if I can fit it here, is mass times velocity. So we can take this expression here, m times v, and replace it with p. So angular momentum is basically the product of the linear momentum times the radius of the circle. Now as a vector, you might see it like this. Angular momentum is a vector. It's equal to 
in this case, R cross P. But that's for those of you who might be taking physics with calculus. If you're only concerned about the magnitude of the angular momentum, just multiply the linear momentum by the radius of the circle. And sometimes this may be referred to as the lever arm. But in this case, you can think of it as the radius of the circle based on the way it's drawn. Now, let's talk about the conservation of angular momentum. But first, we're going to discuss the conservation of linear momentum and then relate it to the conservation of angular momentum. So let's start with this formula. F is equal to ma. Whose law is that? Let's see if you remember your physics. This is Newton's second law. The net force is equal to the mass times the acceleration of the system. Now, the acceleration is the change in velocity divided by the change in time. Remember, acceleration tells you how fast the velocity of an object is changing. Now, we know that momentum is mass times velocity. So we can replace m delta v with delta p. Because if p equals mv, then delta p is equal to m times delta v. So now we have this expression. So this tells us that the net force acting on an object is equal to the rate of the change in the momentum of the object. So basically, you can think of force as how fast the momentum of an object is changing. Now, if the net force acting on a system is zero, what can we say about the change in the momentum of the system based on this equation? Well, if this is zero, that means this has to be zero. So if the net force acting on a system is zero, then the change in the momentum has to be zero, which means that the momentum has to be conserved. So if the initial momentum of the system is 100, that means the final momentum of the system has to remain 100. It can't change. Whatever it was before, it has to remain the same after. Now let's see if we can create a similar situation with angular momentum. So we're going to start with an expression that looks something like this. Now the rotational equivalent of force is torque. The rotational equivalent of mass is inertia. And the rotational equivalent of acceleration is angular acceleration, represented by the Greek symbol alpha. So the net torque acting on a rotational system is the product of the inertia times its angular acceleration. Now, notice that acceleration is the change in velocity divided by the change in time. What do you think the angular acceleration is going to be? Well, the rotational equivalent of linear velocity is angular velocity. So angular acceleration is the rate at which the angular velocity changes with respect to time. Now, we saw that momentum is mass times velocity. Angular momentum is inertia times angular velocity. So we can replace I times the change in omega with delta L because that equals inertia times the change in omega. So thus the net torque acting on a system is equal to the rate at which the angular momentum changes with respect to time. So if there's no net torque acting on a system, the angular momentum cannot change. Delta L has to be zero. So the initial angular momentum of a system has to equal the final angular momentum of a system. So we could say that the initial inertia times the initial angular velocity is equal to the final inertia times the final angular velocity. And this equation basically describes the conservation of the angular momentum of a system if there's no net torques acting on it. Now let's think about what this means. 
if we increase the inertia of the system, what's going to happen to omega, the angular velocity, such that the angular momentum is conserved? If you increase the inertia of the system, the angular velocity will decrease. So one way to illustrate that in real life situations, imagine if you have a turntable. So let's say uh, this thing is, let's say this is the axis of rotation and it's spinning. And let's say that the inertia is 10. Let's just use a nice simple number. And let's say the angular velocity is two radians per second. Now let's say if we add some mass to it, if we just drop this mass directly down on this turntable. And let's say that we place it in such a way that the new inertia of the entire system, that is the turntable and the mass, let's say it goes up to 20. What do you think the final angular velocity will be? Will it be more than 2 or less than 2? The initial angular momentum is going to be inertia times, I mean, I was just going to say alpha, but inertia times omega. So 10 times 2. That means the initial angular momentum is 20. The final angular momentum has to be 20 because momentum is going to be conserved. There's no net torques acting on the system if we drop the, the mass directly down on this turntable. So 20 divided by 20 is 1, which means the final angular speed has to be 1 radian per second so that this remains the same. So if you increase the inertia of a system, the angular speed will decrease. Now the reverse is also true. If we decrease the inertia, then omega has to increase. And this particular situation can be illustrated with a skater. If you ever see a skater, when they're spinning with their hands stretched out, as soon as they bring their arms towards their center, as they cross their arms, they're decreasing the inertia. And you'll notice that they begin to spin faster. And it's all due to the conservation of angular momentum. So as they bring their arms closer to, to each other, um, the inertia decreases because the mass is, all the mass is concentrated at the center. And as you decrease the inertia, the angular velocity will increase. So that's why they begin to spin faster as they bring their arms closer to their chest. And so physics can explain a, not, a lot of uh, natural phenomena that we see in the world today. But that's going to be it for this video. Hopefully you enjoyed it. And uh, thanks for watching. And don't forget to subscribe to this channel. Now for those of you who want more uh, physics problems to work on, Check out the description section below, and I'm going to post a few links with some uh, more videos that might help you on this topic. Thanks again for watching.